Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode or another uh, webinar by DGU Presents. In today's webinar, I'm happy to introduce Marsha Rubin and Nola uh, Mas Masterson, excuse me. Dr. Marsha Rubin is an associate professor and program director for GGU's Master in Leadership Program. She was the 2016-2018 Russell T. Sharp Research Professor, focusing on neuroscience, leadership, and complexity. Dr. Rubin also maintains a private executive leadership development practice. Also on today's webinar, we have uh, Nola Elizabeth Mat uh, Masterson. She is a biotechnology industry leader and forward thinker with more than 45 years of business experience in life science industry and in venture capital investment. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And please, uh, Marsha, if you don't mind sharing the starting the presentation. Okay. All right. So just one moment here. All right. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. It's wonderful to. I can't see you, but I can feel your presence, and um, I'm really delighted to be working with Nola. Uh, Masterson, who's just uh, has so, such a depth of experience in biology. Um, so she's going to be talking about the biology of uh, the coronavirus. So let me tell you what we're going to cover. So uh, our topic is to lead, leading amidst the volatility of COVID-19. So to lead amidst the volatility of COVID-19, you need to stay calm. And I'm using an acronym because our brains don't have a lot of brain capacity, and so uh, this was an attempt to make our presentation sticky. The C stands for curious and careful, and Nola's gonna talk about the biology. Uh, the A stands for attentive and alert. Here's where the neuroscience comes in. I'll be talking about that. The L is for level-headed. I'll be uh, sharing some neuroscience about that. And M is for mindful, and both uh, Nola and I will talk about both the neuroscience and biology of this. Um, so I'm going of, my, of mindfulness. I'm gonna now turn this over to Nola. Thank you very much, Marsha. I really appreciate it. So we'll start with the first C in, in calm, which is how to be curious and cautious at the same time about the coronavirus. Basically, uh, can you advance the slides? Yeah, thanks. This is a little, tidbit of how to think about it, the corona CO virus VI is a disease and it was named uh, after the year that it was discovered which is in 19. And this is a picture of what it looks like. This is the crystal structure in of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus and, and we've, we've, we've been able to know this much about it and that is what it looks like. But there's a lot of questions around it. What is the virus? How do we have to worry about this in our families? How long is it gonna go on? Is it airborne? And how effective has the national response been in this case? And what can you be doing to uh, help end the pandemic? So we'll discuss a little bit about this. I, I wanna say first off that viruses are not living organisms. They are not bacteria. They're basically a protein molecule covered by a protective layer of fat. And inside that protein molecule is RNA. And when it is absorbed by cells of the eyes or the nose or the mouth, it changes the genetic code and converts it into a very aggressive uh, multiplier in the cell. But since it's not alive, it's not killed. It decays on its own. And that disintegration time depends on the temperature and the humidity and the type of material where it lies. Viruses are fragile. They can't go through really good skin and they're protected only by this thin outer layer of fat, which is why soap and detergent is the best treatment because of the foam. Because it's when you're doing that foaming of the, uh, of the soap on your hands that it cuts through the fat layer. So you wanna rub for 20 seconds or more. Sing happy birthday twice to yourself. This is part of being mindful also. You can take that time to think about something happy while you're washing your hands 50 times a day. So hot water is best for washing hands and clothes because it makes more foam. 
You can also use alcohol or any mixture of alcohol that's 65% or more because that dissolves fat. You can also mix it one part bleach to five parts of water because that will dissolve the protein from the inside out of the virus. So you wanna avoid contagion and contagion is when the virus spreads. And this is really important because no antibiotics that we know of will kill a virus. They're not living, it's not a living organism. So if it's not alive, it can't be killed. What you, most people don't understand is how to get rid of it because it's there and clothing. And what you wanna be careful of is not shaking your sheets or any cloth that you might use in the kitchen because that will make it aerosol. That will take the virus and put it into the air. And viruses disintegrate in the air in about three hours in fabric in about three hours, four hours on copper and wood, but 24 hours on cardboard, which is why a lot of people are leaving their cardboard Amazon boxes out uh, and being very careful to open them with gloves on. It takes 42 hours on metal, which is really important because that's handrails are often metal and 72 hours on plastic. So be careful of any plastic containers that might have been touched by other people. We remove, yeah. remove. Vir virus particles are stable in cold areas. So, it, you know, they can't go through healthy skin, but you want to have something that if it's dry and warm and bright environments, the virus will degrade faster. Vinegar is not useful as it does not break down fat, but Listerine works because it's 65% alcohol. But don't even think about using straight alcohol from your liquor cabinet because vodka is not 65% alcohol. It's at most 40%. And the more confined of a space you have, the more concentration that the virus can be there. So open and naturally ventilate spaces as much as you can. And I want to just go a little bit into the high level biology of SARS CoV 2, which is the name of this virus. It means it's a severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus number two. It's the second. The first one was in 2003, and this virus is not genetically distinct enough for that outbreak for the scientific community to give it its own name. So it's number two in the SARS area. It's also a positive sense, single-stranded RNA virus. And these are better at avoiding the immune system by being very similar to your own RNA. And they often are exceptionally disruptive to the normal cell function by directly interacting with ribosomes of your host cell. So SARS-CoV-2 is a fast, hard-hitting disease in the right host. And one of the features I want you to be aware of is that it can recombine. So if you were co-infected with two viruses, rhinovirus and simultaneously the SARS-CoV-2, they could mix and match their genes together and reinfect you the way a, a cold comes on and off again and potentially spread to other people. So post-symptomatically, if you have had a serious infection, you need to be very careful after the symptoms are gone because you can be shedding viral particles from any part of your body for two weeks after you feel better. Human to human to animal connection it is possible as we've seen in the Bronx Zoo. You can give the virus to your cats, but there's been no guidance from CDC to avoid animals, but that might change. So going on, Two of the core disclaimers that I always tell people about life sciences and also life itself is that number one, COVID-19 is novel and it's new. And the truth is that the mortality rates and the transvection rates and anything we use to generate data for policy or infer from data is usually incomplete and unrepresentative of the situation on the ground and subject to change. And data is the authority with a big asterisk so you wanna be responsible and acknowledge weaknesses in anybody's reasoning or anybody's sampling and your presentation of knowledge that you might have. So going on to more disclaimers, SARS is a uh, risk group for everybody except children under nine. 
older adults above 65, immunocompromised, long-term smokers, they appear to be more likely to develop the infection and have severe symptoms and be at risk for death. The younger adults in the 20 to 44 account for 20% of the hospitalizations and 12% of the ICU admissions. This is a very serious disease for young adults. And children appear to be less symptomatic, even though they might have the infection. And they usually don't get it as severely, but they can pass it on. So some of the statistics so far say that if you are over 80, you are the most vulnerable, which is what we see in nursing homes. If you have a co or pre-existing condition, such as cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, you are more at risk of having this be a fatal disease to you. If you have diabetes or chronic respiratory disease, CPOD, if you have hypertension, high blood pressure or cancer, these are all factors that make you much more vulnerable to getting the disease. Another disclaimer that I'd like you to know about is that it is not necessarily seasonal. It could be almost over, but then possibly not. This could be three and four waves of this virus. And typically respiratory coronaviruses are seen mostly in winter in the Northern hemisphere, but in the right climate and the populations, they circulate all year round. So it's unclear if SARS-CoV-2 will follow the traditional respiratory season with a decrease in late spring and summer. That's a big hope for a lot of people, but it's not clear yet because there's a similar virus called MERS-CoV, which is the Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome that is seen in Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula. And now we're seeing that year round, but more so during the winter. The last disclaimer is that SARS is transmittable um, through spit and sneezes and objects that have been wiped with spit and mucus. But there, that's a lesser degree uh, than it, it is, is poop. Primarily spread uh, from droplets and by touching surfaces that might have those droplets on it. The virus is found in secretions and saliva. It is aerosol in the hospital especially because that's where you have the disease being spread through sneezing and coughing. And the frequency of airborne transmission is still debatable because you can sneeze eight feet out. So the six foot um, idea of staying that close, if somebody sneezes it next to you, that, that, that could definitely impact you if you're, if you're six feet away. Stool shedding is also described later in the disease, but it's uncertain what that will do to you. So what have we done in America to have this response? Basically, we've been trying to flatten the curve. In the San Francisco area, we're right about at the peak of the uh, immune, um, what they're called, herd immunity. More people have it now than have ever had it before. This morning, the case was about 7,000 in San Francisco, people that have been infected with coronavirus. And of that, we've had about 700 deaths. So the first case was reported in, in, in January uh, 22nd. And since then, we've had over uh, 800,000 cases in the United States with about 33,000 deaths. And what personal protection is recommended by the CDC, what they're saying at this time is what everybody knows, clean your surfaces, wear your mask, and practice social distancing. When we talk about cleaning and disinfecting high touch surfaces, that needs to be done on a daily basis in the household. And that area of, of, of household, we'll talk about a little bit more, but cleaning really refers to, to taking away dirt and germs and impurities on the surface. It doesn't necessarily kill a, germ, kill a virus, but it lowers the number, and that means it lowers the risk of spreading the infection. Disinfecting, on the other hand, can be done after cleaning, and that's using chemicals. Such as, such as Clorox or any other EPA registered disinfections. That kills a lot of germs that are on the surface, but not necessarily the virus. But the process does, you know, take uh, some of the germs away after cleaning and can further lower the risk of spreading an infection. The high touch surfaces that we're really concerned about are tables, hardback chairs, doorknobs, light switches, phones, tablets, touch screens, remote controls, keyboards, your keys, 
that you use to open and to close your doors, handles, desks, toilets, and sinks. So we're, we're asking everybody now to use face coverings. And the do's and don'ts of that is to make sure you can breathe through it and wear it when going out in the public and make sure it covers your nose and your mouth and then wash it after using. Never put it on anybody under two years of age because they could suffocate. And the use of surgical masks or other PPE intended for healthcare workers is not recommended for the, for the public. So going to the last thing which we're doing now, which is practicing social distancing, be prepared for self-quarantine and isolation. Physical distancing is one thing. Don't gather in groups and stay out of crowded places. Uh, but you know, if, if you have been in close contact with somebody who has been diagnosed or has traveled to New York or out of the state since March 1st, you should upgrade yourself to being self-quarantined. And that means keep, to yourself, even in your own house. Someone in self-quarantine say that stays separated from other people and they limit their movement outside their home or their current place of shelter in place. If you have a cough or a fever or shortness of breath, you should upgrade yourself to self-isolation. And isolation is used to separate sick people from healthy people. And isolation in the home means that you should have a separate room, a separate bathroom, and a separate place to stay, if possible. And now I'm going to turn it over to Marsha for what to do in terms of the A in calm. Okay, um, so, um, hi everyone. All right, so thank you so much, Nola. That was very informative uh, and very useful. Uh, so the A stands for attentive and alert. So um, for those of you who haven't hear, heard me talk before um, or are not familiar with brain science, I'm gonna just do a little bit, a tiny bit here. So our brains are wired for safety. In fact, they're literally threat detectors. We have, we have five times as many circuits that pick up threats than rewards. And we are just constantly picking up threats in one fifth of one second. We're constantly uh, scanning for threats. We have two modes of operating, uh, non-conscious and conscious modes. And we are on autopilot most of the time. So if we think about um, at all times, we are exposed to 11 million bits of data. The non-conscious piece part of it is 10,999,960 bits. The conscious bits are 40. So what does this mean? Well, think back to, let's say a month ago, um, or even before the first time that you were driving, let's say to your new place of work. Uh, you really had to think about it. You had to probably use a map. You had to really pay attention. And then when you got to your building, you had to notice how to enter, where to go in, where the elevator was, how to get to your office. After you did it two or three times, it became automatic. And really we've evolved so that these kinds of things become automatic. It makes us more efficient. So let's take a really quick uh, tour of your brain. I'm going to start with your prefrontal cortex. That's right here. It's the most recently evolved part of our brains. It's what separates us from other mammals. Um, and it's the part of our brain that we access when we're um, conscious. And remember that that's only a small amount of time. Um, this part of our brain is called the executive function, and it requires conscious attention. This is where we have abstract thinking and we can analyze thoughts. Uh, it controls our decision making and understanding and long and short term memory and it's what regulates behavior. This part of our brain is also very energy intensive. It takes up and uses a lot of glucose, glucose and oxygen. And in fact, our brain is 2% of our body's weight and yet it uses up 20% of our body's energy. So that's a lot. And I think that explains, I know for me, when I get tired just sitting at my desk thinking, um, it's, I can be just as tired as having uh, taken, doing some physical exertion. The other thing about our prefrontal cortex is we can process just one thing at a time. And there's a lot of studies out there about multitasking 
Um, and the research has proven uh, that we really can't multitask. And, and, and particularly the people that think that they can do it the best have been shown to be the worst at multitask uh, tasking. All right, the second part of our brain is our limbic system. Um, if any of you have seen Dan Goleman, he does a hand model of the brain. This is your prefrontal cortex, this part inside, it's way back in here, is your limbic system. And this is the part that picks up threats and rewards, and it's highly attuned to threats. And your limbic system is also your hippocampus, that's where memories are laid down. And then the last part of your brain is your amygdala. And that's a little walnut sized piece in here. It's actually an almond size. Um, it's where anxiety and fear are centered. It's really what controls fight, flight, or freeze. And what happens is, let's say you hear a large, you're in a dark alley and you hear a loud noise. Well, what happens is that data comes in really very quickly. I mean, below your conscious attention, it comes in through a part of your brain called your thalamus. Um, that data is sent to your amygdala and to your prefrontal cortex. Uh, you, your brain does a quick threat assessment. Again, this happens really unconsciously. And the amygdala stops your slow thinking. So if you've ever been really scared, and I know this has happened to me, that I can, I can hardly think because my heart is beating so quickly. Um, and this is also where uh, if we have, uh, it's called an amygdala hijack, where we may uh, burst and say something that we later regret. And that's, um, there's, there's ways to, to avoid that. So let's talk a little bit about habits. Our brains have evolved to embed habits for anything that's routine and a regular pattern of action, thought, and emotion. So 70 to 90% of the time, we're operating out of habit which frees up our prefrontal cort cortex and it uses less energy. Um, and so this is how, how we've evolved. And um, the parts of the brain that are responsible for laying down habits are the striatum and the amygdala. That's probably more than you need to know about your brain. And one more thing I wanna talk about is neuroplasticity. Um, it used to be many, many years ago that people thought that um, we stopped learning and growing when we were 25. Well, the research has, has shown that that's not true at all. Our, our brains are plastic, we can learn, and our brains can change. We can create new neural pathways. It takes a lot of effort and it takes attention. So some of the habits that we've um, needed to adjust to uh, during this COVID-19, for instance, the, the, we were being told not to touch our face. And I, I've seen different numbers that we unconsciously touch our face 10, 20, 30, 40 times a day without being even realizing it. And I know that I've really had to, I've had to be very, very conscious and catch myself from not touching my face. That, that's been a really hard habit, but it's gotten a little bit more automatic because I put in that automatic attention. The second habit, which Nola mentioned, also is washing our hands. And so, yes, of course, we all washed our hands, but um, how many of you actually have washed your hands correctly the way that doctors do it for 20 seconds each time, getting foam with warm water? That's, an, that's another habit that has required our vigilance and our attention in order to create. We've also needed to create new habits for working. Uh, for most of us who are used to going into an office and being with other people, all of a sudden we are meeting by Zoom or other technologies. Um, I've talked to both students and others who've said uh, their companies are shooting out all sorts of virtual uh, tools for them to use, and that takes attention and learning. It's a, it's a new habit. And then the final thing is we have um, habits of, uh, of thoughts. So uh, for, and those thoughts lead to action. So for instance, one leadership habit of thought is being a micromanager. Um, and that's a, a, a habit of control. And in this kind of environment where everything is shifting for people, that can be a little bit tricky. So staying alert or vigilant requires a lot of our brain's energy. 
And I wanna talk about two relevant social threats. Um, Matthew Lieberman, who's a researcher down at UCLA, wrote a book um, that I think it's called Wired to Connect. So the, the researchers are now, and we of course knew this, is that we are social beings, we are wired to connect and that's really important to us. And we also really like certainty. So one of the things that can trigger us is when things are uncertainty. The ability for us to be able to predict is really important. And change activates our alarm system. In fact, there's some really interesting research studies where people are put in a lab and they're asked to detect, it's called oddball detection. They, get, they have to keep hitting the X sign with their right finger. And if something's odd, they hit it with their left finger. So they keep seeing X's and they hit it and then they get an O. Well, when the O happens and it's intermittent and not predictable, it, it activates one's alarm system. So that's what the researchers are showing how, how wired we are to threats. So the solution for this certainty threat is really to be mindful of your behavior toward others. Changing can make others really nervous. So for instance, if you're usually upbeat and you come into a Zoom meeting and you're a leader and you're agitated, people are gonna pick up on it and that will activate their alarm systems. And the, uh, the other thing is to make sure that objectives are really clear, especially when things are changing so much. And then the third thing, and I learned this in a lot of the change projects that I did over the years uh, with different companies, is to let people know what you know and what you don't know and what you, how you're going to find out what you don't know. So that gives people more of a sense of certainty. The next piece is uh, connectivity. And, and so we are social uh, creatures and we have a fundamental need to be accepted. Um, social norms influence behavior, so we do care, and some of us care more than others. Will others approve or disapprove of what I'm doing? And a lot of these habits, social connection habits, happen starting from when we're young children. Um, there, Matthew Lieberman, who I mentioned at uh, UCLA, did a lot of really seminal research uh, showing that in the, in the lab that social pain, and he had people doing this silly, odd, this silly game where they were lying in an MRI uh, chamber and they were playing, um, it was a, a game, a tossing game with two other characters. They weren't even real people and the people were uh, setting, they were uh, playing, God, I'm having trouble talking, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so they were, they were playing the game and um, the person would get the toss in the, in the fMRI, fMRI chamber. So it would be a three-way toss. And all of a sudden, the other two character figures would just toss it to themselves and leave the other person out. And that activated the same part of the brain as physical pain. So being rejected really does hurt. And actually, uh, in some of the studies of Naomi Eisenberger, who's Matthew Lieberman's wife, also was participating in this study, they found that giving people Tylenol helped their social pain. So just something to think about here. Okay, and so there really is a um, in-group, out-group threat. We really do want to belong to the tribe. We don't want to be kicked out. And so distancing goes against our human desire to connect because social connection is one way that we regulate stress. So I think that's really important for um, all of us to realize that being sheltered in place and isolated for this amount of time is going to be stressful for people. So the solutions are to find creative ways to promote inclusion. Um, one thing, and this is a, a tip that we always give even before COVID-19, but even more so now, is to set up mentoring and coaching systems within your companies and check in with people and with others more often and ask how, you're, how they're doing. Um, typically, we don't always ask how people's families are. That may not always be the first thing it is for some leaders. I think it's really important to do that right now. So uh, this part of the uh, A is to be alert for unconscious leadership habits that trigger a social threat response. 
And so some of those habits, and this is a not an all inclusive list, might be not communicating regularly and transparently with your people. I mentioned micromanaging. Favoritism um, is a triggers threats because people, fairness is a huge social threat if people think, think people's are unfair. Changing things too rapidly without gaining some buy-in can also be a social threat. And excluding uh, people, for instance, uninviting people to meetings that they were regularly a part of could trigger a social threat. And there are, of course, many, many more. All right, so we're gonna go into the L of calm, which is level-headed. And I wanna talk a little bit about mirror, mirror neurons. Um, a neuron is a nerve cell, and mirror neurons in our brain are activated when we perform a physical action and we, when we observe others in action. So it's really interesting. The mirror neurons were discovered by a Dr. Rizzo Lavi, who's an uh, Italian neurophysiologist. He was working at the University of Parma, and he was looking at the neural patterns of motor activity in macaque monkeys. And what happened was he noticed that somebody was licking an ice cream cone um, when the same uh, neurons fired in the monkey. Um, and the neurons also fired when researchers were handling food. So this was a huge uh, discovery. Uh, we've discovered in human there is some controversy about how true this is, but I think for now it seems to be a, a discovery that we can count on. Um, so our, these neurons fire even before the act of observing, and they, therefore um, the conclusion has been that paying attention to others changes our brains. Um, and this may explain why we may automatically mimic facial um, expressions and movements, and we see that uh, with babies doing that. And it also helps explain emotional contagion. So emotional contagion is really the subconscious sharing of moods. And I don't know how many of you have gone to a, a, a sports game. So for instance, we've gone to Warriors games um, and you know there have been games where the Warriors were up and you could just, if you were in the stadium, you could feel the euphoria in the air. And then when they missed a catch or missed a ball, you could feel the, the, the joy going out and you could feel a, a mood of depression. So really it is, we do share moods. Um, so it's a, it's in the central emotional response during pandemics is fear. Um, and the negative emotions from this, these threats can be contagious. So um, this is just, it's interesting. There's, there's a paper that I have in my list of references here that just came out by um, Dr. J. Van Bavel. He's a, uh, neuroscientist, social psychologist at New York University. Um, and he got a whole bunch of researchers to contribute research that might help explain how we're reacting. And I do, and he offers that for free. I have that on my reference list here. Um, what the researchers are saying that appealing to fear can uh, lead to behavior change if people think they're capable. But if people think that they're helpless, it's not, re or uh, it's not gonna really work. In fact, they could become defensive. Um, so really, one of the things for leaders around emotional contagions is number one, be, be aware of your own feelings. If you're afraid, that's gonna transmit to other people. And being um, really aware of the feelings that other people have. Okay, um, there's two things that um, can be done. This came from a, a really good paper from McKinsey, and I also have that reference that you can download load that one for uh, free as well. So there's two things that leaders can do to given the risk of contagion, and one is deliberate calm. And that's really the ability to detach um, and move from being in something to being to an objective stand, stance. So being able to step back and think clearly, that's deliberate calm. And that seems to, I'm gonna just go back here, that seems to um, be true, especially of people who are grounded in reality and able to look at things calmly. And then the second one they talk about is bounded optimism. 
So um, that's really confidence coupled with realism. So you don't want to be so optimistic that you're a Pollyanna and people don't uh, believe you. Or, and on the other hand, you don't want to be what my husband calls Gertie Gloom, where you are just down and depressed all the time because that's also going to transmit. So bounded optimism is being confident and realistic at the same time. And there is something called an optimism bias where some people feel that things aren't as bad as they seem. And, you know, maybe this is going to happen to someone else. It's not going to happen to me. And if we are too optimistic and not careful, again, given this invisible virus, that's not really not a good thing. So we have to really strike a balance between being optimistic and not getting excessively fearful and anxious. Easier said than done, I might add. So um, level-headed leaders uh, demonstrate a shared social identity. So leaders who can, who are level-headed and who can believe and communicate that we're all in this together are much more effective, especially in this kind of a situation. And I just, I took this uh, quote, I thought it was so good uh, from the Van Babel paper, leaders who are seen as prototypical of the group, one of us, and acting for the interest of the group as a whole, working for us, rather than for themselves or for another group, tend to have greater influence. So uh, treating people respect, with respect, and this is pretty obvious, um, elicits more cooperation than threats of sanction. So that's another reason to stay calm and level-headed. And leaders are encouraged uh, to model the behavior that they want to see. Um, again, uh, really a challenge uh, to do when we're sheltering from home and working remotely and through video conferencing and other me electronic methods. So let's move on to the last um, part of CALM, which is mindful. We have the power to regulate ourselves. Um, calming or energizing our nervous system helps us focus and take action. There's been a lot of research around that. Um, there's uh, some research that shows that the conscious use of breath, language, um, and attention can help calm ourselves. And meditation and mindfulness uh, slows down the, uh, an amygdala, amygdala reaction. So remember I talked about we, when people kind of have, have an amygdala hijack, they get really upset and they respond often in ways that they later regret. So there's some research that shows that people who have a regular practice of centering and mindfulness and meditation and are also able to name the emotion in the moment, I'm upset, and that coupled with a long practice of a good practice of meditation can slow down their re reaction time and are um, and that's really a breaking system a natural breaking system in their brain and so we can also co-regulate with others so if we were just to sit together i think we could probably even do this um, on camera um, or you could do this through zoom through zoom but just sitting calmly with another person and breathing we can calm each other down. And then finally, there's something called loving kindness meditation. And that there's some research that shows that it increases social connectedness. Um, and then that when we connect with compassion and positive hopes for each other, we're making a great use of our social brains and co-regulation. So for those of you who are not familiar with loving kindness meditations, and there is, you can, you can Google it, um, but it, it would go something like, you would have three different uh, versions of it. So it might start with, my, may I be, uh, let's see, I found one here. May, may, I, oh, may I be safe, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I live with ease. And then if I were doing it with a, with a group, we would say, we would look at each other and say, may you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you live with ease. And then uh, the, the third level of this is to think about someone with whom you have a difficult relationship and to think about this for them. So that's uh, loving kindness meditation and it, it, there are some research results that show that it's very effective. 
All right, Nola, why don't you talk about how to boost your immune system? First, I have to unmute myself. There's a lot of ways you can boost your immune system. And uh, as Marsha explained, the DNA responds to our mental state. So you really want to stay positive. Uh, and the, uh, the, the idea that the mind and the body connect is, is physically and scientifically proven. There's cells inside the heart that are similar to brain cells that actually uh, you know, can give you a heart connection more than your brain can. Uh, I, I always like to refer to a lot of Greg Braden's books and he has, a, Greg is with the two Gs at the end. There's a lot of videos on YouTube uh, and he's a great translator of science for people today. But you can use elderberry, you can use vitamin C, you can use oregano oil, all which uh, have a, a boosting your immune system. You can do um, baths with Epsom salts and um, you know meditation to increase your ability to relax and strengthen your immune system. And the last thing you want to do is get into fear mode. That will decrease your immunity. Okay, so um, Priscilla, I'm going to pick up here. Okay, so here uh, are some mindfulness, mindfulness tips. Um, tune, tune into your feelings several times a day. Um, tuning into your feelings is, first of all, it's a really useful thing to do. It builds self-awareness and it also helps build em empathy for others. Mindful breathing, there is some really fascinating research and this is, there's some, um, I put in the reference list from the Greater Good Science Center um, slow, calm, focused breathing really slows down the immune system. It helps us focus. It helps us pay more attention. So one, there's many different variations. You can breathe in for the count of three and breathe out for six. You can breathe in for four and breathe out for six try different things, but it's really been shown to help us in terms of calming down and being more mindful. And then the last piece is keeping a gratitude journal. journal. And there is some um, fascinating research that shows that this is really helpful to, with, in terms of managing stress. And I remember many years ago when I was first starting out in my career, I remember I took a class and the woman who talk, taught the class talked about, that was the first time I heard about being grateful and, and, and articulating it both in writing and verbally. And I remember her saying, you know, if, if you're grateful that you have, be grateful that you have 25 cents to put in the parking meter, or be grateful that you have a can of tuna that you can open and eat for dinner. So it was a really wonderful practice and it's really nice to see that there is some research now that um, shows how effective uh, it can be. So it, it, what, it, what, it, um, what it does is it really helps us in managing stress. All right, so we are here at the end. So our, the idea of this talk was to share that to lead amidst the volatil volatility of COVID-19, and this should be 19, sorry, um, stay calm. So you wanna be curious and cautious, attentive and alert, level-headed and mindful. So let's open it up. And if both Nola and I could be on for questions, that would be great. And I'm going to take the slides off. Oh, and here's, oh, here are the references. And um, I will put this together for Priscilla to send out to people. We have some folks saying thank you so much to Marsha and Nola in the chat. And there was a question um, or a comment from Linda Lee. This was a timely and informative speak. I am looking forward to applying this at my work. Thanks for making the slides available after. 
and a lot of a lot of thank yous in the chat but please everyone you're welcome to unmute yourself and to ask Marsha and Nola your questions uh, hi guys Michael Papnick here hello yeah so my quick question is how can we help family members so other people in our family, you know, either immediate or otherwise, you're only on the phone now, you can't really see them in person, or even in your own household, I guess. But I'm just curious, I so appreciated all these ideas, and I'm curious, how can I help someone else? Or is there a way, because you can find yourself trying to argue with someone, like, oh, it's not so bad. Well, that doesn't work. That's a really bad idea, right? So what would you suggest, if, if, if anything? Thank you so much. So do you want, I can take it in the NOAA, let's, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of it is first of all to regulate yourself. And then the second thing is to, you know, amp up the empathy and compassion and ask other people what they need. And also I think it's okay to have people acknowledge their fear and how they're feeling. So being able to really share honestly with people at this time and, you know, be willing to make yourself vulnerable and allow other people to be vulnerable. I think that having that heart connection is really going to help. Nola, anything you would add? Um, listen more than you talk. I think that this is a time for listening because it's not, ev everybody has a different reaction to COVID-19. Everybody has their own uh, thoughts about it. But I think that as a, as a, um, but when you listen with heart, you aren't thinking of what can I say next. You're just hearing the emotional content of the words that are being spoken. And it's a skill set that um, given the fact that we can't touch and we can't hug and we can't be with each other, we really need to develop in a more acute sense of listening. Thank you so much for that. Thank you both. Yeah. Very much. It's Bruce Jeanette. I've got a question just to you all to comment in today's age as opposed to 20 years ago. I know I am. I've become a news junkie. I check it on my phone every morning. Uh, and besides not going on the phone and not listening too much to CNN or Fox, how much do you think the media and the pervasive nature of media today has actually contributed to uh, the, the, the natural fear that as, as humans we, we have from this? That is, a, is it a major cause? Is it just a reflection? God, I guess so, yeah. Uh, let's see, Noli, you want me to take it first? Yes. Okay. I, I mean, I think that's a good question. I, the, I mean, the research, and again, this, this paper, the uh, Van Bavel paper actually did address some of the things in the media. I mean, I think on the one hand, we all need facts so that we could make informed decisions. I think, and um, you know, there are some people out there that are saying that um, headlines that are so scary um, are contributing to the stress. So I think, I mean, I'm, I used to watch a lot more media. I'm really limiting it for myself because I can feel myself getting stressed out and I don't want to go and get into that place. And on the other hand, I think it's really important because things are evolving so rapidly. So I think going to places like cdc.gov and going to places that aren't media outlets is a really good way to get information right now during this time. Yeah, Nola, yeah, and, and I would go back to that two core disclaimers that I said about life science and life, and that is that data is authority. And getting data scientifically is not the way that most people on the newscast give you the facts. Anthony Fauci was good about saying that we're going to follow the data, uh, and, but, but that he is the only one that I talk, that, that talked a lot about data. And that the data is to be cautious about anything that you hear in terms of numbers, because they may be higher, they may be lower, that's, they may not be reporting. Marsha and I were in Mexico in uh, mid-March, and we were informed by people that have lived there for 30 years that the Mexican government was not reporting in the cases of COVID that it found, because they had a two-tier 
system of medical care and the people that went into the higher system of medical care never were reported as having COVID-19. So the data is, is there, but it's not always exactly what you'd like to have. Um, but be, 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 I know that, that you can get overloaded with um, the news media hype about how fearful you should be. But the fact of the matter is this is a serious pandemic and we should all be extremely cautious. When you walk into the house, you should wash your hands. When you do anything, you should wash your hands because we're of an age group where we really have to be careful. And, and it's, it's a serious problem right now. And it really doesn't matter how much data you get, it's real. Thanks, Thanks. Bruce. Anyone else would like to unmute themselves to ask a question? This is Nancy. I have a question. How do, Hi, you, how do you explain this to other people the same age as we um, who are not taking this as seriously as I feel they should or, or, or it, that the data is, is saying that they should? And how do you do it lovingly, Nola? Because I know you're the one that can do it very lovingly. Well, you know, it, this is an environmental hazard. It's like any other environmental hazard. Uh, it's, it, it is, it, there are people that will be succumbing to this virus and there are people that won't be. It's almost a matter of self-care. How much do you love yourself? And Nancy, I would use that word. I mean, if people aren't loving themselves, say, I'd love to see you loving yourself more. Thank you, Nola. That was extremely helpful. I knew you would be the one to be able to put it in a perfect way. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. I was really interested in the, I'm not sure which of, which of you brought up the contagion effect, mm -hmm. having to do with uh, leadership and how fear and contagion can work together. And I feel like that um, we're, we're, we're seeing that happen right now. And um, you know, it has a political aspect to it, which we don't need to get into all the aspects of that. But um, I'll just say from my own part, uh, in order to, to deal with that, I'm uh, mindful that I, um, that I work politically to overcome the, um, the po political contagion effect of, of fear mongering, I'll call it. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you have any comment on, on that. Marcia, I think that was your slide. Yeah, I mean, I think we, emotions, uh, we are much more emotional beings than rational beings. And a, a negative emotion like fear just transmits. You can, you can pick it up, you can feel it. So I, I think, uh, I, I love the phrase, the work is ever with yourself. Um, so really the work is with each and every one of us to be mindful of our emotions and our emotional state and to have ways to calm ourselves down. I know when I start feeling a knot in my stomach or tightening in my chest, I can sit down and calm myself down. There's, a, there's so many uh, methodologies now and we're lucky to live in an age when there's lots of different apps um, I was I, I was on a call last Friday. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Ruth Zaplin from American University, told me about it. It was a, it was called coherent resonance, and the idea was to think of something that you're bothered by, and then start breathing and really breathe into your heart. As as Nola said, our our brains are connected to our hearts, and then think of someone who for whom you feel love. And then ask yourself how, from that place, how can I deal with the situation that's um, bothering me? Um, 
so that's that's one of many and, the, and it was very helpful i did it for myself it was really really helpful so that's one of many ways that we can calm ourselves down and i think again the work is ever with ourselves to keep ourselves calm because we can only control ourselves that's right okay thank you hello hello yeah, can you you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Oh, incredible! Um, <laughs> just my laptop is very old. Um, this is Carol, and I have one question. I met, I came in about five minutes into it. Is this presentation going to be available uh, later? Is it being recorded so that I can access? Okay, good. That's part one. Part two uh, is I have been in touch with uh, somebody I went to school with who likes to send me articles on how this contagion started and where it started. And I have pretty much dismissed those as conspiracy theories and blocked her email. On the other hand, we do have a mutual interest in medical aspects of this. And so I've gone back to communicating um, with her and I really am focused on what can I do to stay safe, number one. <laughs> what can I do to keep um, family and friends safe, number two. And number three, how can I maintain contact with this person without getting so ticked off at, at the political aspect she's sending me that I just don't want to hear it. And maybe it's correct, but if something is a bioweapon, there's nothing I can do about it. I can stay inside and and uh, communicate with 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 people in an uplifting way. So um, yeah, I, you know what? Those comp conspiracy theories are just that they're theories, and I I don't think they do anybody any good. To to and and I've heard them all from five G to bioweapons to it's the Chinese trying to level the playing ground. Yeah. It, we have had SARS COVID before in 2003. We have had pandemics of the Spanish flu. They didn't go into conspiracy theories when we had them. This one should not either. It just fans the flame of fear. So uh, I would talk to your friend and say, I, 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 I love you, but I don't want to hear anything about conspiracy theories anymore. Well, thank you. She doesn't think it's a theory, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try. And I don't love this person. It's an associate, but I, uh, I will keep those in mind. Thank you. Very good advice. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't have a question, but I do have a suggestion. If you can take a variation of this and make it available to heads of HR or somebody within companies that are essential businesses, I think it would really help because I know lots of employees who are getting up and going to work who are dealing with fear and doing their jobs anyway. And this would be really helpful for the companies dealing with the employees. Actually, I would like to add to that, give it to the C-suite, not the HR people, because I think you really need to start at the top. This was excellent. And I think there cannot be enough awareness for this at the top level of the decision-making process, at least. Thank you, Petra. Thank you, Donna, for your suggestion. Well, we will, we, this will be, this is recorded. You can take it, you can pass it out once it's finished and, 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 and spread it to your community whoever you think needs to hear this. That's why we recorded it. Yeah, yeah. Pass it on and I'll be sending out the uh, sl uh, a slide deck with references as well. Or yeah. Priscilla will be sending it out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much everyone who came. Thank yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you, Nola, so much for the informative uh, webinar. And, uh, and we will be sending everybody the, the recording as well as a feedback survey. Um, so if anyone would like to, to, I mean, a lot of people are continuing to type in their thank yous in the chat. So um, I would like to virtually hand 
a hand of applause to both Marsha and to Nola. Thank you both so much. Thank you. It was lovely to see everybody today. Yeah, thank you. It was great. And thank you for being here. And we really appreciate it.